Hey everyone, Tech Steve here, and I'm with Dr. Mark Blackwell. Nice and to meet you. Nice to meet you too. And behind us, we have a, what, do, what would you call this? So this is a flying car. So we're looking to deliver flying cars um, to the world, bring dreams alive. So this exact model here is a tech demonstrator. So this has flown in Japan, uh, one-seater vehicle. So with our test pilot in Japan under uh, uh, restricted airspace, We've flown this vehicle three, four meters, uh, figure of eight, fairly low speed. But the, 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 the objective really is to prove that we can develop this kind of vehicle in a safe manner. Now, we are busy, busy in Japan working towards a certifiable vehicle, which will be released 2025. 2025 so, so that's okay. when the public can ride on a vehicle be similar to this. There'll be differences because we need to increase the safety, reduce the noise, improve the range. So there will be design changes. But it will be similar to this vehicle and will be launching in the World Expo in Osaka in 2025. Operation will be kind of overseas and leisure and tourism type application. Sightseeing and really introducing this new form of transport to people and giving them that experience. Wow. So uh, with the prototypes that you guys have been using, what type of uh, range, battery life, what, what should someone expect at this particular time before you guys get the, you know, the main model made? And, you so know, we, so it, it all depends on things like weather conditions and where you're operating. But if we say an, an average operation, we're looking at below just below 10 minutes um, and five, six, seven kilometer range, okay. which is modest. But if we look at the Osaka Expo, um, to get from, for example, Universal Studios to an expo which is on an island, maybe that takes 30 minutes going inland on road transport. On this vehicle, five minutes. So we're, we're looking at really saving time, even over short ranges. As we advance, as battery technology improves, as we improve the vehicle design, we'll increase that range. And we're looking towards 2030, mm -hmm. a range of around 20 kilometers. And that's when we will kick in with autonomous flight control, so we will need no pilot. Wow. And the, the user will be uh, effectively a flight planner, so picking locations they want to go, and then the autonomy will take over and, and take them there safely. So what do you say to the people who are scared to be in the air with autonomous vehicle <laughs> and something goes wrong, what would you say to those people? So we, we build this vehicle, this whole company is based around safety. That, that's the number one thing. Without safety, the company doesn't exist. So we have a, a lot, very large safety team. We work closely with the regulators in Japan, the US, Europe, to make sure that this vehicle is designed to a level that is equivalent to conventional aerospace um, today. So when you fly from San Francisco to Vegas, you'll have the same level of safety as you would in a, in a vehicle like this. So we, we're really looking to push safety. The redundancy is built into the system, so you'll see a number of motors and propellers. We have multiple battery systems. So if we have a failure, if there's a bird strike and we have propeller damage, the vehicle is still safe. We can still safely land in an emergency scenario and even continue to the original destination. Okay. So it's all, it's all built in there. So, last question I had, uh, as far as navigating an autonomous system, is it a infrastructure built with an application, or how does that work that you wouldn't fly into a restricted area or fly over water or somewhere that you, the drone doesn't need to be? How, how, did, how is that all controlled? So, the, so the, the level you're referring to there is, um, we call it U UTM. So, originally un unmanned tra traffic management, so unmanned in a sense of there's no pilot. So that, that traffic management system is, has been developed with, with drones, with cargo drones and camera drones. So that, we, we rely on partnerships on the ecosystem to provide that UTM level. We're mainly focused on the vehicle, but we need to work closely with those partners that are building the infrastructure to enable this to happen. The airspace, that's a really good point. We need to look at the existing air traffic management system, right. the uncontrolled airspace, and then that bit in between and make sure that it's a fully integrated system. That's a huge job. You need everybody on board, the regulators, UTM providers, the vehicle guys, yes. service providers. It's, it's a big job. And there's lots of effort globally. And in the US, NASA have big programs on this. Within Japan, we have, um, we have lots of companies working on we have a partnership with NEC, and this is an area that they're actively involved with. So it's really bringing the ecosystem together is key. Okay, yes. You know, I, I know as I said that was the last question, but I did think about one last thing. Sure. Uh, weather. This yeah. particular one looks more like a convertible. 
Uh, how about snow, <laughs> ice, rain? Uh, have you guys did any kind of testing in those type of environments at this point? That's, that's a really good point. So the, the certifiable product will, will have a canopy, so it will be fully enclosed from the weather. Uh-huh. We'd look to, we'll, we have an operating range, an envelope that we define as, okay, we are certifiable within these, within these wind speeds, these temperatures, humidities. And of course, we want to make sure that envelope is as big as possible, so we don't have, so we want high utility rating. If, if we get extreme weather, really high winds, really lightning is an issue as well, Potentially, we have to we have to grow on the service, but as the technology improves and we can um, we can improve the stability of the vehicle and make it more robust to extreme environments, we can gradually expand that envelope until you know almost any weather condition is is flyable. But it is for sure it, it is a big consideration. Okay. Well, you know, Dr. Mark Blackwell, I really appreciate the information that you uh, gave us on this. Um, flying vehicle and I'm excited to see this type of technology come to the market and it looks like you guys are definitely leading the way when it comes to uh, a technology like this. It's pretty remarkable how far we came in, uh, so far. So, yes, thanks uh, so much for stopping by and hopefully you're going to have a seat in the vehicle after this interview. Okay, I'm definitely yeah. going to do that. Thank you. In a few years we'll have you in the sky. Thank <laughs> you. <laughs> I'll be there for it. Cheers everybody. All right, guys, I'm going to attempt to get into the SkyDrive. Let's go check it out. We are in here. Wow. Look at this. Inside of here, there's a cockpit that has a digital touch screen, which is pretty cool, and it shows a map of the city. So there we have it guys, uh, got a chance to sit in the sky drive and 2025, this may be something real that we could be using on a daily basis.